this excellent article we're discussing uh the importance of instagram in the whole electronic music space dance music space whatever you may call it it's titled mix mag oh sorry it's titled instagram reality um again i'm a fan of the articles mix Mag put up so i recommend you check it out if you're a fan of dance music so this is an article here says the following um the culture phenomenon of the post decade is changing the way festivals and clubs are designed how instagram is changing the design of our clubs and festivals now is the summer of our disco content um i've seen it myself i think having worked briefly for a company that was doing festival tickets i saw how important social media was to the companies that are pushing the festivals obviously for sales for exposure for interest whatever it may be maybe even sometimes for brand sponsors sponsorships or partnerships further down the line I liked their approach. Um, I thought it was all cool, no problem. But also, I think the prevalence of social media at festivals um, has been noted and also something that was inevitable. I think if you're a festival organizer, uh, promoter, planner, you had to realize that there was a dearth of new people coming into festivals. I think the old school festival type people who knew about festivals from back in the day and weren't really trying to share the secret had kind of aged themselves out of the scene naturally. So uh, promoters had to basically um, cultivate a whole new audience. And the only way to do that was to kind of tap into the social, native, younger, um, you know, um, post-millennial generation out there, right? And they care a lot about being seen at places as opposed to just going and enjoying them, right? So with that being said, you had to create spaces where they could essentially uh, become your ad hoc influencers and ambassadors for your... Uh, first of all, why are they paying you to attend? It's pretty clever if you think about it, right? Because they could spend 20 grand on an influencer and tell them to come take some pictures, but they could also get, you know, thousands and maybe close to millions of pounds worth of exposure for free for people to actually attend the event if they have some really cool backdrops and places with their branding on it that people can take pictures at, right? And especially some really iconic stuff. I think of Wireless, I think of Love Box, um, I think of Love Park, I think of um so many dimension man festivals that have the little kind of backdrop place where you can kind of take a picture of yeah and i even think of places like Bergheim, which is probably not the best place to do those kind of things because they don't necessarily let you take pictures but how many images have you seen of people standing on that little walkway up towards the Bergheim with the Bergheim in the background towards it because obviously there's nothing near the Bergheim. it was an ex-power plant so it's pretty sparse around the kind of surrounding areas so any angle you take that picture at the one thing that's dominating the, the frame is this big gargantuan you know rectangle concrete box right or the square concrete box that's the only thing that's that's kind of uh showing you that you've kind of been there even the wristband won't do so that's kind of a, a weird little backdrop thing and that's worked really well so i don't really mind it i think for the most part the festivals that do it the most are the ones that probably i probably won't end up going to anyway and i think they attract a certain audience but again if you're comfortable with that audience and you don't mind then i have, I have no problem with it because most of those designated social media spots are way away are very much away from the actual stage people can dance it gets a bit annoying sometimes when you watch certain people or you go to certain festivals when everyone has their phone out recording that can be a bit weird because you're trying to get an angle and then everyone's blocking you because of their arms and their phones that can get very frustrating and of course you don't want to bump anyone you don't want them to drop their phone so just built up a lot of stress a lot bit of anxiety and not of the most um you know carefree kind of environment which festivals should be really you should be worrying about what you look like on your phone but you know what can you do so go back to the article how instagram is changing the design of clubs and festivals <laughs> written by duncan dick I'm not sure if that's actually his real name but if it is big up you uh we're weaving our way through a dusty field there are palm trees on the horizon low slung tents to the right and space age arch huge dome to the left at one point a ferris wheels uh fills the sky crowded with 20 somethings and cut-offs and leggings of vintage style dresses and sunglasses this is clearly a main furrow a main furrow furrow fair whatever it's called right but not everyone is on the way somewhere we see first one, we see the first one, then two, then three people standing if frozen to a spot by a rave gorgon. <laughs> one foot in front of the other, hand on hip, head cocked to one side, and a friend with a phone kneeling or crouching a few feet in front of them, like some kind of pen, um, pentinent. We pass another of these uh, tableau, then another, yet more pairs crowded over the phone to check angles and lighting. The 26 second clip is from Reddit. The post is by this guy here. So I think this is a Reddit one, right? This is the famous clip from Reddit that shows... Um, uh coachella being a content farm that it is which again i have no real issue with i don't really mind it personally but i think the video itself was pretty pretty funny um so here's a video here get up and see if it shows here 
but essentially just shows these young girls just as they're walking towards Coachella they just basically just got in you know that kind of festival buzz and they're all just standing around taking pictures of each other I'll describe it to you if you listen to the podcast episode people are literally on their phone in this amazing festival right where they should be having loads of fun you know the, the boyfriend here having to take a million angles of his girlfriend with the pictures of her crossing her legs pointing upwards <laughs> Girls in jean shorts. Everyone doing pictures. Everyone, right? That fucking foot in front. That one foot in front with a toe down, with a heel up off the floor is a, such an infuriating pose. No one, I repeat, no one looks good. It doesn't look natural. It doesn't make your leg look less skinny or whatever it may be. That kind of angles thing. It's all a lie. And they're just doing it to be sheep. But yeah, anyway, let's get back to the article. <laughs> um, blah, blah. Um, so I guess, so the cat also continues. Uh, the pack knows, knows, normally knows better, explains uh, Seal Krakow of the University of Copenhagen, a leading international expert in how environmental design can be used to nudge behavior and uh, psychology. If you stick with them, you are safer. We take cues and cognitive triggers from the environment and what the people around us are doing, and this is called the bandwagon bias, something that I've kind of been very against from the onset. Like, I think for the moment, I'm, I kind of realize what's going on around me and you're conscious of the way people kind of act and kind of just follow things because everyone else is doing it because it's cool. I now make a conscious effort. As soon as something starts to get too cool or people start to bandwagon something i just jump off i don't i don't do, i don't i don't oppose it i don't uh do the contrarian thing and jump on the other opposing opinion or view of product or services bandwagon i don't do that i just jump off just in classic hipster fashion i just jump off i refuse to go go again it's not it's not for me um again because i don't i don't want to be that person that's ruining someone's fun but also don't want to subject myself to this kind of you know um, everyday average Joe kind of nonsense that everyone else is jumping on. That's not what. That's not the life that I want to live. I get one shot at this life, one really short window to enjoy my time on this planet. And the last thing I'm going to be doing is following people around and asking for their recommendations and shit. Nah. Um, it's the reason. Uh, so it continues. It's the reason she explains that subconsciously we follow the crowd when you step off the airplane, and the reason why Netflix tells you what's the most popular with everyone else when the series finishes. Netflix, the, the airplane one is a bad example. I think the escalators is a better example. Escalators I tend to always take the one that no one else has taken. I think you see a lot at Little Bushy Station. They've got like three or sometimes two escalators that go up. And if everyone else is going that one onto the one on the right, I'll go to the one on the left just, just because I, I want to be a bit different. And the Netflix suggestions thing, I don't think I've ever watched anything on Netflix that was suggested to me. Or oh, people that watch this also like that. I don't give a fuck what everyone likes. I go and watch stuff on Netflix that I get recommended by other people who I trust their opinion on TV, right? I don't just recommend what everyone else is watching the everyday public. I don't care. Uh, again, but that's me. I'm I'm different. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Um, so it continues here. It's why when you see crowds of people taking a selfie and got for the gram, you feel the urge to join in. Nope. You just walk by and continue doing your stuff. On an individual level, she says the psychological impulses that Instagram uses triggers from bandwagon bias to the uh, dopamine reward of the like to loss aversion. Broadly, this psychological term for it is FOMO, right? Our myriad. Uh, not all surprising to its creators. The main reason it has become such a, a huge phenomenon uh, for some people, it can quickly become part of their system. I behavior, system one behavior, sorry, the unconscious routines and instincts that guide 90% of our decisions. Uh, the Roman Empire is needed. Let's continue on, blah, blah, blah. So this is loads of pictures of people at Coachella doing the same pretty much pose in front of that massive Ferris wheel, right? Everyone's got the same sort of picture. And to be fair to Coachella, they designed that fucking Ferris wheel really well. Uh, maybe it's a setting that it's in the landscape but in everyone's frame it's essentially dominating the entire background of the frame right and if you're very clever and you like to use your angles you can get a good picture of even if it's really busy there so that's a very very big win in terms of marketing right so great on them um in terms of growth the biggest clubbing success story of the past decade is elro right let me just quickly blow my nose because i'm sniffing way too much yeah, God. i should have actually used my my fucking um, inhaler but hey what can you do so it says here the biggest uh the one in the biggest terms of growth is Elro, which I, I agree with i think i remember when i started working for that ticketing company Elro was you know i yeah when i worked at ticketing company i think i realized just how big Elro was i just wrongly assumed that it was just you know a little not a little operation that ran outside that ran mostly mostly in the uk and in europe but mate they've got Elro's popping up literally everywhere, right? And they all sort of like run on their own or some shit. I don't know how they do them. 
you can essentially go to Elro kind of all year round, then if you want to, right? Um, once just as once it was just an eccentric family run club in a dusty countryside outside of Barcelona, it's now a world trading, which I like actually. It's a family run operation, and I'm pretty sure I remember watching an interview with the son that's sort of like taken over. I think one of the sons. I think it was maybe on IMS Ibiza. He did a little panel discussion. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the bus is now washed out in a mega brown with residencies in Ibiza to Vegas and events from Jakarta to Manchester with an average attendee of age of 23. I'll give you the main reason for this exponential success is the way that Elro has harnessed the power of social media to spread the word about. Of course, they have a really good stage show. Um, again, something I wouldn't necessarily want to go to myself, but I think objectively, they do really good stage design, right? If you see here, Elro... Uh, let's see, this right stage. Right? The stage DJ booth is really cool. Sometimes they have dancers and they're really kind of naff, I beef away. But I think visually, if you're going to go to a festival, right? Imagine you went to a festival and you saw this sort of stuff, like glaring at you as you're looking up at the DJ and wondering, oh, how do I get behind that booth? Look at that. Confetti everywhere. You've got these acrobats swinging off the rafters, lights, fireworks. Like they go ham. It's all similar to Tomorrowland. Again, not something I'll go to myself. Um, you know, not necessarily my kind of music, but you have to kind of salute and give kind of props to the stage design and the the, the, the money that goes into the production of that festival. Because I remember watching a video of this bodybuilder walking around um, Tomorrowland and I didn't know how big the flipping site was. There's whole restaurants there, spas, massage parlors. Like, it's, in, it's, it's, it's especially built a little village, little town. Uh, for when Tomorrowland comes around. So you can, you can only imagine how much that must cost for a company like them. And even if they're getting kickbacks and deals and stuff, it's still a lot of money. They could make a, probably a lot more if they just put a stage, one stage up, some screens and a, and a table and let DJs, you know, and imagine just the booking fees alone. So they're probably not making that much money on that festival. So for them to do that just for the love and just for the experience and just to kind of separate yourself from everyone else in the pack and say, no, nah, we're a different breed. That's amazing. So yeah, big up Elro. Because again, like I said, in terms of if you went to like a UK or London festival, there this is quite norm, right? Every kind of every other festival has a really good, a really nerdy, enthusiastic person who gives a shit about the culture, producing stuff like this and going the extra mile, you know, curate. I mean, producing the space, um, designing it, making it a bit special. But of course, you're used to festivals where they just have it in the field with some speakers. Right, it, this can seem weird, but for me, it's not that big of a deal. But again, I think in the space that they're operating in, it's really amazing. Um, marketers call it so. This, um, I'll give you the main reason it's um, ex the exponential success is the way they operate behind social media, and more importantly, the pictures of their multi colored spectaculars. Marketers call this peer to peer, turning your customers into salespeople, which I mentioned earlier. Right, David Jordan's the chief um, revenue officer of Elro. He basically said, I'm in charge of everything that brings in revenue in, but mainly I'm in charge of the marketing, which is weird, isn't it? Why would you have somebody that's in charge of marketing, in charge of revenue? But if you think about it closely, marketing should really be making you money, right? That's the whole reason why you do marketing. But I don't know, for me, because I'm so jaded, you've been involved in startups too much and I've been involved in too many kind of sceny, cool streetwear things where marketing is sort of like a, a brand exercise just for you to kind of promote yourself or to kind of get, your, get, your, get the word out there, right? <laughs> Let yourself be seen. But the real point of marketing was essentially to kind of, you know, garner some attention or garner some, you know, some eyeballs to the thing that you're making in the hope to convert that into sales. That was the whole point of it. Um, I like what they're going back to that kind of roots, right? Um, Jordan's background is in online advertising, which makes sense, a bit different from marketing, and he is keenly aware of how important Instagram is to our success. He says, in the last five or six months, it has come, it become crucial. Right, it's even soon, it's even more recent than I imagined. Because I really did, honestly, I remember when I started a ticket company, Elro was big, but it wasn't as, it just seemed to like, I don't know, over the last few months, it just, gone up like a rocket mate um he said here 90 percent of our ticket sales are online and all our branding and investment goes online and on top of what we do uh, on our own channels instagram today is where our users are sharing Elro. Elro says that david Elro say, uh, says david um, is able to calculate how much this user generated marketing is worth and he puts the average at somewhere around hundred thousand euros per show unsurprisingly this means that when we prepare a new event or a new animation activation the first thing we think about is how it's going to look like on instagram which is fair isn't it i understand that um an Elro and early adopter of setting up areas with mirrors or games that work as selfie prop which is awesome that's the really cool thing to do i think now especially if you've got a business i think there's a few restaurants i've seen online there's like what's that is it a pink is it a cafe is a shop it's like a cafe i think in central london i'm gonna say soho or i'm gonna say chelsea somewhere around central london where they have this amazing amazing interior and they have really cool outside area too whoever founded that coffee shop 
whatever it's called bravo to you they have a really cool interior loads of really cool sort of like a um, neon uh signage inside mirrored walls some cool sort of like flowers on the outside i think it's i think it's pink but again something that you have to kind of keep in consideration when you're running your business nowadays just one of the things and again it's an easy win isn't it if you're good on social media and you actually have the knack for it why not um it continues here but it's but it's long mastered the art of integrating Instagram into experience it's organic and authentic it feels as natural as dancing one vivid example is the paint used for his epic underwater themed uh Ru- Madas main stage in a picture the texture looks wet it looks amazing it's like coming from the sea explained jordan indeed his designers have not just created an ex- environment that's instagram friendly they've centered the sort of augmented reality you can't really see the texture in real life only in the photograph he marvels oh wow that's pretty cool isn't it instead of seeing yeah i like that idea in the, in the middle of a dj set you could have a moment where a character opens a door to another dimension a lot of characters like from science fiction movies in the 80s go through the dance floor and everywhere not on stage but in the middle of everyone these moments work as handy cues to focus shareable, shareable hyper photogenic moments to the crowd the genius of errors turning something that could be passive taking a picture into something interactive and immersive focusing it via narrative into specific moments also helps to maintain immersion the rest of the night the animations mean you don't just have people going on safari with their phones all night as you post, which makes sense isn't it really i like that so in a weird way even though they've got a lot more props up there people tend to kind of like take the picture share on social and then just enjoy themselves in the moment around all this wacky shit which is pretty cool you wouldn't think that you'd think with all the distractions that people would be on their phone all the time but i don't think that's necessarily the case um as creative director of the Vibration Group, Simon Aldred has overseen the design of two of the most important new cultural spaces in Europe the past decade, Printworks and the Warehouse Project in Manchester. Um, his background in festivals design means he visualizes his events in these found, reclaimed, converted industrial spaces as indoor festivals. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. That explains a lot about Printworks and the production that goes into it. That's interesting, isn't it? Thinking of a club as an indoor festival as opposed to a night because it's not a nightclub right a nightclub i would say what do you say a nightclub is by definition if you had to define a nightclub by definition in, define it in terms of capacity i would say a nightclub is somewhere where maximum 500 people i want more than that is too much it's not really a nightclub right it's, it's something more than a nightclub i think 500 people is probably a nightclub and i guess somewhere somewhere dark right no windows maybe a basement somewhere or whatever that would be a nightclub too because there's places that are kind of clubby but not really. There's more seats and and predominantly where ninety percent of the square footage is made up of just the dance floor, no seats or anything. I think that's a nightclub. Anything else is just like fake. I would say so, right? Um, but yeah, that's a very cool way to think about it. Wow, clever, isn't it? No one of these guys get paid the big bucks to design these spaces. <laughs> um, um, he says this um, da, 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 and has enabled him to both respond to and shape the changes in the UK clubbing behavior. He says, currently, the sound is absolutely the first thing we think about. Of course, you have to do that. Especially if you're using a reclaimed spot, you have to kind of take advantage of some of the kind of, you know, leniencies you might get with the sound police, I'd say, maybe, right? Uh, but definitely, um, but I definitely uh, recognize that we do think about visuals, touch points through the venue. When it, when, even if it's as simple as light boxes that say drinks and a giant print works light box, we all know that girls and boys are going to stand in front of it and do that thing where they kneel down and do the group shot. Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. That's amazing. <laughs> Different. I like how he speaks about it. Like he, he half despises it, but also knows the game is a game. These guys keep me employed. They keep the club full. They drink, they buy drinks, they have a dance and they go home. You know, you can't be mad at that, right? Different nights and audiences, though, have different priorities. And Aldred wonders whether audiences for the Hydra, the external promoters who run Primo's flagship underground night, booking outside Jeff Mills and Helen Hel- Hel- Huff, give a damn about it. No, they don't, right? Just true. Good point. Probably not. The Hydra audience would just be interested in the music and the DJ and the sound. But Instagram absolutely affects the design of the spaces. If not initially, it evolves. It's not a priority for us, but more and more in any conversation, someone will go, well, the audience take photographs, which I like. I guess if you're going to be smart about it, you might be it, it might be beneficial to kind of give to put all the bells and whistles on the night when it's kind of i don't know someone like a script or something where the audience might be more conscious about sharing stuff online and then have uh, some spaces that are not kind of modular places that you always kind of light up and just leave them there for the night side of the hydro or maybe allow the hydro to come in and put a screen. imagine if you got like a light box with like the printworks logo they could just come in take off that screen and put their logo on it or maybe put some logos of the djs that are promoting that might be quite cool or just strip it down i don't think that's that that should be that much of a problem but again i like this idea that there's no middle ground there has to be you have to decide who you're kind of aiming towards and then just kind of double down on it i look at somewhere like a grease muller and look at somewhere like a trezor right 
two completely different audiences. I say go to those kind of clubs when you go to Berlin. Um, but they really double down on the audience that they're after, right? Grace Müller kind of looks like the people that go to Grace Müller, and they're really focusing on that group. Trezor is the same, right? They're really focusing on that kind of um, techno tourist that's going to come into town, and they make that night special for them. Um, and I like all that. Uh, and it continues here. Um, the nature of social media means that Aldred and his team are able to track in real time which areas of space have become hotspots. Wow. Yeah, you just got to go on social and you see how many pictures people are taking on that area, right? You see a lot with them um, fold, even a fold don't allow pictures. You know, that that bloody, those, um, that kind of perforated window thing where all the light shines through and they decided to put some screens on there was a fucking genius step. So you'd always see people taking pictures of there over the weekend. Um, we're aware, we are aware there are probably eight or nine. Oh, so, okay. As you, as you first go into print works, there's a giant sign that uh, did create a bottleneck for pictures. So we moved that to an area where the people can use the backdrop. Nice. We're very aware that there are probably eight to nine spots in print works. For instance, where people first go in, the money shot of all the motors in the courtyard have a big signage that says print works. Sick. And we're seeing some more groups standing in the black, black, black corridor outside as you first come in. But if I'm honest, these spots are kind of adopted by the people. If you know what I mean. Things we just thought were nicer their core pieces are now being adopted as little icons of print works. But I guess now we know what we become and we probably are amplifying that a little bit. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, with Depot, which opened in the year, converted train station, Aldridge's team were able to apply that, what they learned to found spaces, confirmed from scratch. The big learning from print works was that where there's a massive room, we've kept the room massive. Oh yeah, that's what I like about it. That's a good point. Good, good, good. Um, I, I, These interviews are fucking awesome. I love finding out stuff about the scene so interesting so uh, that's what i liked about the warehouse have you seen the images of the warehouse project in manchester the depot it just looks very sparse because the ceilings are fucking high way 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 up there um and it sometimes i think the first time you see it it kind of fucks with your head right um the warehouse project uh, manchester depot right it really fucks with your head when you see it for the first time because you think, oh, there should be something filling that, right? There should be, I don't know, like a net or something you might see in that beef. I don't know, something. There should be something you, you feel about it. But then the more you the more you look at it, the more you kind of keep abreast of it, the more you're like, ah, no, no, no. This is absolutely perfect. This video of like Nina Kravitz playing um, at the Apex Twin party on her, on her Instagram is a good example of it, right? Look how, look, look, at, look at how high that ceiling is, right? I know that it's, it's flashing and stuff. Let me try to get up here on the screen. But look how high the ceiling is. And look how dark it is too. The only thing illuminating from that whole room is the CDJs and the lights, the LEDs that are running currently around the whole space. But I like how they just, you know what I mean? And I also would think, imagine right, if they were able to somehow um, find a solution where they essentially uh, made it similar to Bergheim. Because I think the Bergheim booth, you can't even see it when you're in the main floor. I swear to God. Yeah, maybe you can. No, you can when the closer you get up to because usually I'm at the back where the kind of plinths are, right? So imagine if they kind of created a scene where they kind of essentially um, put a screen in front of the DJ booth or kind of lowered the booth a little bit so that no one could see where the booth was and it kind of was... Yeah, you know, that'd be really cool, dis disorientating if, like, you create these little false... DJ spots where, like, you had, like, performers or silhouettes kind of moving side to side, pretending like they're DJing, but they're not. And it's just all around the space and you didn't know where the DJ was. And then he just popped up in the middle of the, middle of the room like a wrestler. Like, ah! <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. But yeah, I, I love that. I didn't really think that. I didn't think that was purposeful. Uh, I just thought they just didn't know what to do with the space. But again, that's very, very intriguing. That's all really purposely done. Like, just keep it completely sparse. But yeah, go back to the interview. Um, da -da -da -da. Keep it massive to make sure that everyone gets that experience, that epic wow, that total immersive sound. But then obviously acknowledging the fact that everyone is going to get their phone up immediately. Aldo is looking, okay, so some um, give and take. At the depot, there's a giant set of original yellow doors, which I suspect will become icons. Once we know what people want to share, I guess we'll make it easier for people to share them. Oh, sick. Awesome. I like, I like their approach. And of course, they've got some images here of the epic, the iconic Berghain um picture that people take i've never taken one i just feel a bit cringy i usually take a picture of my wristband or something or the stamp i think that's a bit more authentic but everyone does that picture it's usually i think it's more it should be more reserved for people that go there for the first time i think first time especially if you finally get into the burger after years of trying i think you're allowed to kind of go in front of the burger and take that kind of selfie no problem or someone to take it for you but i think if you've been there a few times it's a bit cringe to do it i've been there you know probably more times i've been to fabric so no and i also think it's really advantageous to go there when you when you, when you do a gig right because this is our comedy store you know the comedy store in la that all the comedians love and they kind of wank over and they all want to get spots there this is our version of it if you're a techno enthusiast so if you, even if you're just a fan 
or even if you even if you're a DJ like myself, up and coming, you're trying to make your way through. I think just getting in there is a big deal. So I think if you're a comedy fan, you like all these podcasters, right? And you finally get to the comedy store, you're probably gonna take a picture of yourself, you know, standing in front of the comedy store sign or in front of the flipping set list. But I think if you've been there a couple of times after the fact, it's not it doesn't really have the same sort of punch. But again, I, f- I think it's all cool. I, but it's even more cooler because the Bergheim is notoriously against social media, right? So for them to kind of um, fall into this social media um, kind of uh, drive activation just by proxy of like what the building looks like and the fact that they haven't changed it because you know somebody else would that's the thing i like about some places too where they just don't change shit right they just, they just keep repeating the same thing that's worked for them they don't try and fuck around with this with the, with the recipe or try and add some lights to it they just no this is works so we're just going to keep it like the burger the same just kept the decor exactly the same change some stuff around here and there i think panorama doesn't have those hanging speakers hanging suspending by chains anymore uh they've now changed but for the most part it's relatively the same right if you've went in the 90s you've got it now you won't be shocked and you know appalled by what's going on in there um but yeah interesting article man i recommend you check it out um there's a lot in there to read i'm not gonna read the whole thing because it's long but definitely check it out it's titled uh, instagram reality loads of really cool insta bits in there the cultural phenomenon of the past decade is changing the way festivals and clubs are designed available now on